spots. All right. All right. So why don't we start out? Why don't you kind of introduce yourself and explain your relationship uh, to Ray Bradbury? Okay, um, I think my relationship started as a fan, like a lot of people, because um, he let a lot of fans eventually into his life in various ways. Um, started as a correspondence partner many years ago. I would write to him and he would always write back. It was very nice. Um, and then I first uh, met him when I moved to uh, Denver, Colorado. He was doing a, a book signing and a lecture near in Boulder and uh, I went up there and I met him for the first time and um, then when I moved here about 15 years ago I would see him at book signings occasionally and here is uh, LA right LA where he lived yeah and uh, I would see him at lectures and things like that occasionally but I didn't really know him um, and then I started to work on a film project with a friend of his named Forrest Ackerman and I wanted to interview him for the film. And so I saw him at a book signing in Ventura, and, um, which is near where I lived. And I asked him if he would interview for the film. And he said he would. And he gave me his phone number. And um, he scribbled his phone number in the, in the back of my copy of Dark Carnival as I gave it to him to sign. And he says, call me next week. And so I called him next week, and we set up the interview. And I actually took Forey Ackerman over to his house and did an interview with both of them together, which turned out really well. And that's oh, neat. My yeah. next project. That one got put on hold because of my uh, involvement in the film project with Bradbury, which we can talk about later. Um, yeah. And so then I got to know him. And um, we would, you know, occasionally go out to dinner, go over to his house, go to his plays. Uh, I think twice I went with him to Comic Con. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And uh and then later in his life when he was homebound and couldn't read because of his eyesight, I would go over to visit him sometimes and read his stories to him, which he loved because he he loved to hear his own stories. And um he loved to remember that he that he could write like that. Yeah. So uh I would do that as well as a lot of other people would do that as well. And so that was really Kind of how I got to know him. So I only really knew him in the last, uh, I would say, seven, no, let's see, five, six, yeah, from 2005, really. Was, so I, I knew him when he was in his 80s. Wow. He sounds like a pretty accessible guy then. I mean, that's something a lot of people have told me was that he was famous for that. People would write him and he would actually write back. I mean, you say yeah. he pretty much res responded every time, more or less, or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he always would write back. Great, great. And then I should probably point out, because other people are going to see this, Forey Ackerman is very well known in his own right. He was the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland, and he also at one point had the world's largest collection of science fiction and uh, horror memorabilia. They were friends all the way back to when they were both like 18, 21 years old. So right. that's really neat company that you had there. Yeah, I've met a lot of people... <clears throat> um, in the film business since I've been out here. And most of my favorites are people who are uh, 80 and above. They seem to be the most interesting <laughs> people to me and the ones that I like, like most hanging around. Yeah. And almost everyone that I've met has come through Forey Ackerman in some way or another because he was the first. Right. And through him I met Bradbury and through him I met other people, uh, Earl Hamner, it may be on down the tree, you know, it may need to be directly related to Forey, but it was because of that. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, Earl Hamner, uh, George Clayton Johnson, Bill Nolan, uh, Richard Matheson, um, just loads of other people. And then a lot of the younger folks as well, John Landis, Joe Dante, sure. you know, uh, uh, Guillermo del Toro. So it all came from the, the, the tree growing from the root that is Forey Ackerman, really. Very right, cool. And so you went with Bradbury to um, Comic-Con. What was that like? I mean, were a lot of people asking him for autographs and things like that? Yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, 08 was one year. And there may have been, I think it was 06 or 07 was the other year. I went with him only a couple of times. Yeah. 
And uh, it wasn't because I was really that much of a comic conner. I, I'd never really been, I think maybe once, but I went because uh, he was there. And one year Ackerman was there as well. So yeah. that was particularly interesting. Um, so of course, when you're invited to go, then you're gonna go. So, yeah. but it was a lot of fun to, to hang around with him and, uh, and see that. Yeah, there was a lot of that. He was, uh, he was like what they call the rock star. He was uh, pushed through the crowds in his wheelchair with his uh, entourage and his, uh, his crier running ahead of the group saying, Ray Bradbury coming through and the part <laughs> crowds would part and make room for him to come through. But every so often, well, fairly often, every uh, people would stop and, and, uh, and want to talk to him and get his autograph and get a picture with him and the women would want to kiss him and he would always leave the lipstick on his cheek because he loved that sort of thing. He loved to be uh, loved. He was very social. Oh. Yeah. And so you said that you read his own stories to him. Did he have any favorites or was there any particular types of his own stories that he liked to be read back, like any book collection or anything like that? No, he had, the, he had a, well, I think he had 10,000 books in the house, but he had one of his really large bookshelves in the bedroom. So he would usually just uh, point to a book on the bookshelf and ask me to read the table of contents. And from there, he would go on to choose one of the stories that he wanted to hear. So okay. he would pick. It would be whatever he wanted to hear at the moment. So there wasn't any particular fancy for the Martian Chronicles or the Illustrated Man or anything like that? or. No, usually a short story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, um, the biggest experience I personally witnessed was not me reading to him, but uh, was uh, a friend of mine who read to him. I used to take actor friends over to either perform for him, you know, some, maybe one of his short plays around his bed or uh, the cast of Fahrenheit 451. And I did a, one of his Irish plays once for him around his bed. And then I would take other actor friends because they were really good at reading, obviously, because they're actors. So uh, much better than I could be. And I remember my friend Arlene Martell, uh, more famous for Twilight Zone and Star Trek appearances, yeah. I think, probably than anything else. She wanted to go and do a reading for him. And she went and had never met him before. But uh, she did a wonderful reading of The April Witch, at the end of which he was in tears, saying it was the best that anybody had ever read anything to him. And Thanks. said it was so beautiful. So he loved that sort of thing. He, he loved to remember that he could write like that. I mean, he still could, but he loved to remember the old stories and just uh, remember that uh, he wrote that and said it was so beautiful. I can't believe I wrote that. So he loved that sort of thing. Man, he was very nostalgic. Yeah, yeah, he was pretty much the king of nostalgia and sent, he always, he was always unembarrassedly uh, sentimental. Like he, he, he wasn't offended when people described him that way. Yeah. yeah, and he kept everything. I mean, ticket stubs to serve a play or whatever that meant something to him, he kept it. Everything from his life, from when he was a kid, clippings from comics, things like that. Yeah, yeah, you, so this would have been his house in, how do you pronounce it, Shavoy Hills? Mm -hmm. the, so, I mean, like, in the on the TV show, they always showed that office just kind of cluttered with stuff. Yeah. I mean, is that what you say? What his house was like? Were there toys and? Yeah, the whole house. Well, maybe the whole house. I don't make it sound like a, a hoarder. It wasn't that. It was that he kept great things, and it was organized relatively. Maybe not so much down in the basement. There was a lot of boxes of stuff, but it was it was labeled and it was um, all important stuff certainly to him and to any Bradbury fan, I would imagine. I, I remember being there when uh, his golden retriever, Don Albright, as he called him, he would, called him? <laughs> would be there and he would be going through the boxes of stuff looking for scripts that were unpublished or stories that were not quite finished and he would get him to finish the stories and put together the books and that's, that's how some of the newer books came out in his later life was just Don Albright finding things laying around that he had not finished yet. Oh, right, right. Yeah, it's like one more for the road and things like that. And yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Neat. So before I forget, why don't you talk a little bit more about your documentary? That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah. Oh, before, I, you had mentioned something about The Office. I meant to say something else. Okay, sure. Uh, the, uh, on his TV show, I think some of that was filmed in his office on Wilshire Boulevard. Yeah. 
and he had an office there at, a, at some time, but then he, uh, he, he didn't keep that office and he started just to work out of the basement of his house. So but at, the time of the, <clears throat> at the time of the TV show, <clears throat> he had the office there. And I think some of that was filmed there, but uh, it wasn't actually in his, his home basement. And um, the, uh, the parts outside in the halls, the elevator and that sort of thing were actually filmed in a place called the Bradbury Building. It wasn't actually where his office was, but they filmed it because it looked good. And it's been filmed in a lot of TV shows and movies, so. Yeah, that's a national landmark, isn't it? The Bradbury Building? Right, yeah, and it was, and a connection is that uh, that building was, um, if I'm not mistaken, that building was designed by an architect who happened to be Forey Ackerman's grandfather. Huh. Yeah. It's a small world. Yeah, I think it was something yeah. like that. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and um, let's see. Yeah, and I have some other stories, but I think we're going to do those later. Um, yeah, just, uh, I'm really <laughs> curious about what your documentary is about. Yeah, um, it's a uh, it's an art film, and a documentary. I uh, I was at a party in LA uh, many years ago, and uh, and someone approached me and asked me if I'd like to do a documentary film on a project they were working on. And it turned out he was an artist, and it turns out he was a very well known artist. I didn't know him, <clears throat> but his name was Sladoff, Christopher Sladoff, and. Uh, he said he was working on a document, I mean, on a, uh, an art project with Bradbury. And would I be interested in making a documentary film on the creative process? And so I said, of course. And so I started to do that. And um, it turns out it was a statue. It was still in its clay form. It was about eight foot tall. And uh, it's been bronzed since then. It's finished. But at the time, it was still, he was still working on it. And... Uh, <clears throat> And it turns out that it was about Bradbury's father, and it was also about Mr. Electrico. They kind of incorporated both of it into the statue, because those were two very important things in his life, formative things when he was a child. And I won't go into the whole Mr. Electrico story. You can see him tell the whole story in the film. Uh, oh, okay. But uh, yeah, but um, he he wanted me to to do that. And I didn't find out for years that it was uh, actually Bradbury that had recommended uh, me to Chris. I never knew that. I never knew how he knew me at the party, but he just came up to me and asked. And, and it was Ray, because he remembered me from the Forey Ackerman project. And so he recommended me. And I'm glad he did, because we made this beautiful film that I'm wearing here. And there's a picture of the, uh, of the back of the Italian clay version of the statue before it was bronzed. Okay. It's a whole really interesting story, which is in the in the documentary. What what is the documentary called? It's called Father Electrico. Okay. And the reason is because it incorporates elements of his father, and it incorporates elements of Mr. Electrico. Both the back of the statue is obviously um, the illustrated man. Um, in the front of the statue, which you can't see here on my shirt, but the front of the statue is a more traditional um, image of a a man holding a 12 year old boy in his arms. Ah, you, cool. can, you can hear all that story in the, in the film as well about what actually happened with that. Um, so it kind of incorporates really three elements, really. The front is, uh, is, the, is the father and the back is uh, Mr. Electrico and the illustrated man. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot what you asked next. Oh, no, I was just curious, when, where would we be able to see this documentary? Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be shown at the uh, Ojai Film Festival. That's O-J-A-I, for those okay. not from Southern California. It's a small town um, about an hour and a half north of Los Angeles. It actually is, happens to be the town I live in as well. But uh, yeah, it was picked up by the Ojai Film Festival and is going to be shown there this um, November 9th. I don't know the time yet. So if you just want to check the uh, website of the Ojai Film Festival, they will eventually have up more information on that and the times of the showing. And how is that spelled again? Ojai? Yeah, O-J-A-I. Okay, cool. And what was your Forey Ackerman project? Just a little curious about that. That was more of a traditional interview type program. Um, and, uh, and that got put on hold because 
Um, I really wanted to have it done by his, his, uh, his 100th birthday, but it wasn't finished because I was waiting on a few interviewees who had promised to uh, interview for me and maybe one or two that I thought was hopeful. And I thought the film project would be better with that. So I kind of waited. And then I got really involved in the Bradbury film. So I put the Ackerman film on the back burner for a while until I could finish the Bradbury film. So now I'm trying to get back on the Ackerman film to get it finished. But I mean, when Guillermo del Toro tells you that he'll do an interview for you, <laughs> you want to hold off for sure. that. Sure. And it's been difficult since he told me that. It's been difficult to get the interview. So I'm yeah. still kind of waiting around. And, um, you know, Peter Jackson is a really good possibility. Wow. Uh, he had he had indicated he'd be ha happy to do it for me, but was not going to be in America in the foreseeable future. So maybe we can figure out a way to do something like we're doing right. this interview. So maybe we can eventually get a couple more people into it before we start uh, with the editing process. But I think I have enough to do a good film, but there's a couple of folks I'd like to wait on if I can. And uh, that's pretty much what that film is about. It's going to cover about five different aspects of, um, of uh, Forey's life. And it's going to kindly have everyone in the film talking about that. And it's got, um, well, it's got quite a few people in it. Like I said, it's got interviews, in-depth interviews with Forey. It's got a really good interview with Forey and Ray, uh, George Clayton Johnson, um, Joe Dante is in it, uh, John Landis is in it, and uh, many, many other, uh, uh, Don Glute. So a lot of people who knew Forey well, and a lot of people who got into the business because of Forey's influence. Right. Cool. Neat. Well, bringing it back to Bradbury, do you have like any favorite stories or anecdotes about your time with him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or any quotable quotes from Bradbury? He seems to be full of those. So. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Well, he was always very bad when it came to uh, what he wanted to eat. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to be eating certain things later in life because of the diabetes, but he would pretty much, you know, try to eat what he wanted. And so there was a place near his home called the Apple Pan, which was a traditional local hamburger joint. And, uh, and sometimes when I went to visit, he would like for me to bring him a, a hamburger and uh, a chocolate malted from there, but he wasn't supposed to have it. But he commanded me to bring it, and so, so I would bring it. Um, and it would make him happy, which, which is good. Because being happy, I think, adds to your life as well. Sure. So, you know, it might have been a, a give and take there. But, um, but he could command me because he uh, was made a commander by the French government in the last few years of his life, a commander of the arts and letters, I think it was. And they came with a medal, a medal which he wore just here, good size. Oh, gold. yeah. And he would wear it. He always wore a tie. But when he got that medal, he stopped wearing the tie and started wearing the medal instead. And he would wear the medal everywhere. That was, uh, that was something that was kind of interesting about his later life. Is he, would, he would wear that medal everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, sitting around the house, things like that. I would go over and visit. He would be wearing the medal, sitting there in his chair. <laughs> and uh, he would wear the medal when we went out to supper and uh, things like that. And I remember that, you know, he would occasionally spill food or something on the metal accidentally and have to be cleaned off so but yeah he, he enjoyed his metal um and because he was uh, a commander he could now command people and so he would introduce his plays from the stage like that, <laughs> that uh, this is uh this play and and i command you to love my play he would say to the audience so so he he liked he liked that very much yeah yeah, he turned a lot of his stuff into live theater right there in L.A., correct? Like... Yeah, yeah, he had an uh, extra income from uh, the Martian Chronicles being optioned by Universal, and they had it oh. under option for several years. Hmm. And so he had a goodly amount of income from that, and he would spend that money putting his plays on, and he never made any money back from that. Nah. But he would spend it, that was his hobby, that was what he wanted to do and so every Saturday night he would be there in the front row watching his stories come to life on stage and that was what he loved so he put a lot of effort into writing his stories into play version and uh, having them produced and then going to watch them 
I remember when he put on Fahrenheit 451, which was an excellent version, by the way. In 2008, I remember extended it. They kept selling out and they extended it a couple of times. And I was there, I think, I went to see it eight times. And it was really good. Yeah, he, a lot of those other plays as well, but that was one of the ones that was re that really ran quite a while. Um, and the wonderful ice cream suit yeah. was uh, really well done. That was one of his best and one of his better films as well. I remember going to that one with uh, Ray and Stuart Gordon, who uh, directed, I think, the original one in Chicago many years ago, and then the film later, of course, as well. Um, Falling Upward which was his Irish comedies. That was, that was his best play. And he put that one on um, a few times. And I got to see that one a couple of times with him. And I remember even in the last months of his life, when he was clearly never gonna leave the house again, he was still excited about that. And he would bring it up and when I would go visit and, he would, and we would talk about it and how that was our favorite of his plays and it was so good. And he would say, do you think you can help me put it on again? And I would say, well, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I'm not in theater, but I, I know, you know, I know people who've done it and who, you know, who produced your, your falling upward in the past. So I'll, I'll let them know that you're interested. And of course it was too difficult to do because that was a pretty big play and it cost quite a lot of money to put on. And uh, they, they were never able to, to raise the money to get that put on again, at least not while he was still with us, but he oh. tried. And I remember when he uh, he was going to be giving out the Ray Bradbury Creativity Award to his friend, Kirk Douglas. This was also just months before he died. And he was insistent that he was going to be there to present it in person. And everyone knew he was not going to be there. But uh, he had a backup of, of another friend of his named Bo Derek. And finally, he, uh, he said, he says, call Bo Derek, because he, he realized that he wasn't going to be able to make it. But he really thought he would. And that was the way he, he did everything, was he really thought that he would and he could do these things and he had every intention of doing them. And he loved to go out. He hated being stuck at home and he loved for people to come visit him. And, um, and I remember I brought him, I would bring him things. Like I would find, like once I found an old, um, a story in a magazine from LA in the mid sixties, a story on Walt Disney that, uh, I think he was, he figured in the story, if I remember. And um, of course he was friends with Walt Disney and he loved Disney and loved Disneyland. And I remember I brought him a copy of that, um, that magazine article and read it to him and he loved it. And, um, and I'd bring him things, you know. And I told him, I said, once I says, I'm your, um, I'm your emissary because he wrote a story called that. Sure, by the dog, right? The this boy couldn't get out of his bed. Right. His dog would go out into, you know, into the town and the community and the neighborhood, and he would bring things back that would be representative of the sights and sounds and smells. And like in fall, he would go and bring back, you know, dead leaves in his coat, and, and the, the boy would experience, uh, uh, you know, fall through things like that. And so I told him, he says, I'm your emissary. I'm bringing you these things. And he loved that little connection. Cool. Fun. Yeah. So where, which theater was it? I'm just kind of curious in LA. Was it, was it always the same theater or? No, but um, he spent a lot of time at the, um, at the Fremont Center Theater in South Pasadena. That was where the majority of the later plays were put on. But there were there were other ones earlier. Cool. Yeah, I know he was a big fan of live theater, and so falling upwards would have been was that kind of semi autobiographical about his because he mm -hmm. lived in Ireland as a young man. He wrote the screenplay for Moby Dick for uh, John Huston. So yeah. is that sort of what that was based on? His time in Ireland as a young man. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know that every story in it was. I don't think every no. I don't remember. I don't think it was like a completely autobiographical thing, but it was based on that. And I think a lot of it just turned into like, you know, the Irish comedy stories and things like that. But yeah, it was based on his, his experience of living there. And he did some stories that actually were on his TV show about that. One was uh, called Banshee. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was directly related. That was completely autobiographical. Uh, 
except for the Banshee. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the John Houston part and the rider, that was Bradbury. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was all based on that uh, that time he spent there. And I just saw a film again, I'd seen it before, but I saw it again called Stan and Ollie, and it features Oliver Hardy and Stan Laurel when they went and did their, um, their tour in 1953. Um, and, it has a, and it ends with their, uh, their show at a theater in Dublin. And Bradbury was there. He was a big fan of Laurel and Hardy and he was there and he, he would always say, tell that story that he was, he got to Dublin and he, he saw that Laurel and Hardy were appearing that night and he rushed to the box office and he bought the last ticket available and he sat there and watched him last, last, that night in the front row with tears of laughter running down his face. And, uh, and then it was actually a film where they actually covered that. Yeah. They didn't have they didn't have Bradbury in the film, but yeah. or, I mean, but it was actually in the same, it was the same uh, thing he was talking about. Well, neat. Yeah, he loved Ireland. He always spoke fondly of his time there and actually loved France too. He loved Paris. That's probably why he always wore that medal. So, yeah, yeah, he used to go there when he was younger. Well, I don't know when they stopped going, but uh, I don't know, maybe in his 70s. I really don't know, but for a long time he went and he wouldn't fly for many years because he was afraid of it, but he had to fly once. Yeah. Uh, he was, this was I think in 81 or 82, 82 I think. And he had to go to uh, Orlando, Florida because he was working on the Epcot for Disney. And um, something came up while he was in Orlando that required he get back to LA quickly. And so it was not an option for him to take the train back. And he had no other option but to fly. And he never flew because he was afraid of flying. And so they were trying to figure out what they were going to do. And uh, as I remember, I think he said, uh, pour three double martinis into me and slide me onto the plane. And they slid him onto the plane and he found out that he wasn't as terrified of flying as he thought he was. And after that, he would fly much more often and that's when he started flying to Paris I think um, because they had the Concorde and he could get there really quickly and so they would fly every year uh, for quite a while they went there I think that's where he met Bo Derek she was right. there, I think on a train going to Paris and he was out over there and I think he met her there hmm. on the train and they became friends Neat. yeah he always said that John Houston gave him a hard time of, about being afraid to fly because here he is the guy who wrote about rockets to Mars and he was afraid to fly, so. Yeah, and he, well, he was more afraid of driving and he never drove. Right, ever. right, he never learned how to drive, yeah. Never learned how, never wanted to learn how. He was, uh, he was afraid of it, but he, um, of course, he, he was driven in cars. I mean, you had to be in yeah. LA, yeah. but uh, he never drove himself. But did ride a bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> to his office on Wilshire Boulevard. He would often be seen riding his bicycle. Yeah. Cool. Neat. Yeah. And uh, yeah, speaking of the Martian Chronicles, I could tell that uh, real quickly for you. Sure. Because uh, I spoke earlier of the option that Universal had on it. And um, it was kind of funny because it's my favorite of his books, but the, the miniseries from 1980 was, was terrible. <laughs> and Brad, so Mark Hudson, right? Yeah. Brad, and Bradbury agreed. He thought it was terrible as well. Although I should note that he did not blame Richard Matheson, the scriptwriter. He yeah. said it was the production. It wasn't. It wasn't the script. Yeah. Uh, and he's probably right because it was a poor production. But um, so because it's my favorite, and we would often talk about it when I was there, and. Um, and this was when Universal had the option on it. They were supposed to be doing redoing the film. It was a theatrical film. And um, I remember once he told me, Universal has 17 scripts on it right now, <laughs> he said, including three by me. <laughs> he says, they figure, I don't know how to write. <laughs> and then he said, he says, we'll colonize Mars before they make the damn film. <laughs> and he made me write. Yeah. Because uh, we're, uh, we're on our way to colonizing Mars, I think, right. pretty quickly. And uh, Universal doesn't appear to have any movement on the film. So he may be right. Well, that would be cool to see. But 
Yeah, there's actually, what is it? A, is it a crater on Mars that's named after him? Yeah, they named it Dandelion Crater, I think. Yeah, cool. is it the one on Mars or the one on the moon? Yeah, yeah, he has both. It was Dandelion Crater, and I think there may be another one named after him. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, he would love that, though. Yeah, because yeah. He, he always loved the idea that he was an influence on actual rocket scientists who worked yeah. at Caltech, which he yeah. visited a lot. So he actually got to go there and see some of the... Uh, some of the uh, things in action over there. He loved that. And they yeah. love to have it. Yeah, he knew a lot of those people. It, um, I heard a story about him. So he apparently was asked if he thought a UFO had actually crashed at Roswell. And he replied, ah, they would have told me. So he, because <laughs> he knew a lot of people in the Air Force and in NASA and stuff like that. So he's, he's convinced somebody would have leaked it to him. So <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, neat. Well, this was a lot of fun, and I really want to see that documentary of yours. So I probably won't make it to California, but let me know when you have it available in some form. I'll buy the DVD or something like that. We'd be happy to help you with that. So, and I wish yeah, you, I really yeah. hope the Ackerman project takes off. That would be really neat. Yeah, I've got um, someone I think um, is going to start back on the editing process on that. Okay pretty soon if if not already so so maybe and I, i'm gonna i'm gonna try to to uh talk to guillermo again later today and see if i can try one more time to uh to get him to maybe now in the global pandemic he's not as busy making three films at once so maybe i can actually nail yeah. him down to a short interview that would be great so i'll give it a shot and um but yeah as for my film yeah you could watch it on the OI Film Festival website, I believe, in streaming mode on okay. November the 9th. I'm not sure of all the specifics yet. They haven't told me how it's going to all be working as far as, um, uh, you know, anything as far as times or anything like that. But uh, they just told me November 9th. At some point during the day is when it's going to be on their, uh, on their streaming. And... Um, and as soon as that's over, I'm going to uh, to put the DVD up on my website, so it'll be okay. obtainable there. So uh, johnsasser.co. That's C-O. Okay. And uh, yeah, you can go there now and actually see a trailer for the film. Oh, okay. Yeah. So cool. I got a nice little trailer, which kind of shows you an idea of what it looks like. It's an art. It's an art film, but it's a documentary at the same time. It's a hybrid art film documentary film. And it's a short, it's uh, 20 minutes, 25, I think. So, um, yeah, it won't take up too much of your life. Yeah, you no, totally. It. I'm definitely going to see it in some format. That sounds really interesting. And yeah. I'll definitely see the Ackerman documentary when you finish that. That'd be really neat. Yeah, I hope to have that done by next year. Oh. So, but yeah. yeah, but probably in sometime in November, uh, I'll have the DVD available on my website. Okay. Great, cool. Well, thank you so much for your patience and talking to me again and everything. That's great. And we'll definitely be in touch. That sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. All right, great. Have a good day. Good day. Bye-bye.